you're getting reports from Africa, <coughs> the gospel meetings that are starting. And I think I mentioned to you that we raised some extra money for gospel meetings and we sent, I think, $1,000 each to seven different uh, preacher schools. And they've started doing some meetings, having some good crowds. Uh, had a few restorations and a few baptisms, but it's just getting started, so we'll hear more about that over the next uh, week or so. Uh, had a, a disaster in the nation of Malawi. They're toward the end of the rainy season, and the rains have just been extremely heavy. So they've had floods. They sent us some videos of places where the water was just acres and acres of water, and little creeks that turned into huge rivers and washed away whole villages. There was a period of time this past week, uh, a lot of anxiety. We have about 26 students at the school, preacher school, and I think four of their families, the flood hit their area, and they hadn't heard from their wife and children in two or three days. They didn't know if they were dead or alive. And they finally got word that they're all alive. So that was exciting, good news. And a lot of the uh, families have moved to the school. They're staying there at the school in the classroom because they had nowhere to go. They sent us some pictures of one brother and his wife that had taken some trash bags and split them and put them over a bush. And him and his family were sleeping under the trash bags. So they didn't really have a place to get in and out of the rain. So they're uh, doing better. We sent some funds over to buy some emergency food. All those folks would be hungry. We lost everything they had. Just washed one or two villages, just destroyed the whole village, not a house standing in the village. So they're, they're having some rough times right now, and we pray for them that things will be better for them. Be turning to uh, Acts chapter 14 as we continue our study in the book of Acts. We're looking at the missionary journeys of Paul and uh, some of his co-workers. We talked about how that Antioch in Syria is sort of the starting point. That was one of the big congregations in a big, very important city. And they're going to send Paul out. He'll go across the Mediterranean Sea, uh, north of the Isle of Cyprus, and go over to what we call Asia Minor, and go in those areas preaching and teaching the gospel. Uh, and in verse 1, you have him coming, Paul and Barnabas, preaching in Iconium. And if you look in your maps on the back of your Bible, you can find Iconium there in the, that particular area. And the Bible says that great multitudes believed of the Jews and the Greeks. Great multitudes. I don't know how many... Now that would entail, but there's a lot of folks that obey the gospel. And, and notice how it's worded both of uh, Jews and Greeks. That's different from Acts 2, isn't it? In Acts 2, it's just the Jews. 3,000 obeyed the gospel. Although the commission was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And it took some time, remember? Acts 10 and Acts 11, finally have Cornelius, the first Gentile. And they understand... We see that God is no respecter of person, but in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now Paul is going and preaching the gospel to the Gentiles, the Greeks and the Gentiles as well. Verse 2 talks about the unbelieving Jews stirring up the Gentiles, made their minds evil, affected against the brethren. The unbelieving Jews, the idea of unbelieving, they were willfully ignorant. They were uh, perverting or perversely dealing with the Word of God. They were dis disobedient to God's Word. Now, they were not unbelieving in that they didn't believe in God. They are unbelieving in that they didn't believe in Jesus. They're, they're Jews. So they claim to be Abraham's children and believers in God, but uh, not believing in Jesus. And we've talked about this before. If you really believe the Old Testament, God designed it in such a way that the Old Testament would just logically lead you into the New Testament to accept and believe in Christ. Because there's so many prophecies about Him. Uh, you, you have to be a, a hard-headed, hard-hearted individual uh, to not follow the instruction of the Old Testament to lead you into following Christ. And Paul said in the book of Galatians that the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. 
And that was the, the purpose of the law. Uh, in John chapter 3, talking about these unbelieving Jews, we, we usually look at John 3, 16, God so loved the world. But look at John 3 and verse 36. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Reminds us of another verse where Jesus said, Except you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. So what's going to happen to the unbelieving Jews? What's going to happen to those that reject Christ? They're going to die in their sins. Because Christ is our only hope. He is not a hope. He is our only, only hope. Uh, he mentions the fact that they were evil affected. That is, they were bitter. Their minds were poisoned. You think about poisoning somebody's mind. And you do that by, by saying things about a person. Maybe things that are untrue or zeroing in on a, a, a negative aspect of somebody and just, just going on and on and on. And you've poisoned the minds of some people against other people. And that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to get all of those individuals in their area to have their minds poisoned against Paul and against uh, Barnabas as well. He said, long time they abode, long time therefore abode, they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony to the word of his grace and great signs and wonders done by their hands. And the reason they stayed a long time is verse 4. Uh, the multitude of the city was divided, part believed and part uh, didn't believe. Well, there are those that are believing. They're getting results <coughs> from their preaching. And multitudes, and verse 1, multitudes uh, are coming and hearing, and both of the Greeks and of the Jews are believing. Notice that uh, the signs and wonders, the, the people saw the signs and the wonders, great, uh, they granted signs and wonders uh, to that was done by their hands, by Paul and, and Barnabas. And the, we think about those signs, those wonders. Why? Why are they working miracles? Remember back in John chapter 20. Let's turn back there and look at John chapter 20, verse 31. 30 and 31. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, John says. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through His name. Why the signs? That you might believe. And there's a principle that's set forth that you'll notice as you study your Bible. And I want you to see this. That when revelation is being given, signs are given to confirm that revelation. Go all the way back to Moses, the burning bush. Moses, you go tell Pharaoh, I said, let my people go. He won't believe me, Moses said. Well, what sign did God give Moses to confirm his word? You remember it too. But cast your rod down, and it becomes a serpent. Take your hand, put it in your garment, pull it out, it's white with leprosy. Put it back, it's cured. There's a sign to confirm the word of God. Now Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, Jehovah God says, let my people go. And he did the sign that God told him to do, but Pharaoh still didn't believe. So there were ten plagues, and those were signs, weren't they? They were, they were miracles. And these miracles confirm the word of God. All through the Old Testament, you have miracles confirming the word of God. And then in the New Testament, when Christ comes on the scene and says, I'm the Messiah, he confirmed it with signs. Then the apostles, Jesus ascends to heaven. He commissions them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every preacher. They go out and start preaching, and they confirm the word with signs and miracles. And today, people who claim that they're doing miracles don't understand what the Bible teaches. They were to confirm the Word of God. Does the Word of God need confirming today? No. I don't have to be able to do a miracle before you know that you have to be baptized to be saved. 
The Bible teaches that. It's already confirmed. Jude 3, the faith which was once delivered to the saints. And the, the original language says, once and for all, or one time delivered. So it doesn't have to be confirmed over and over and over again. These signs and wonders were done by Paul and Barnabas. Now Paul's an apostle who received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Barnabas, uh, the apostle Paul, no doubt, had laid hands on and he could work miracles as well. Now we're going to notice as we uh, move through, you, you see the two groups or divisions of people in verses 4 and 5. You have the apostles they're referred to and we'll, we'll spend some time talking about that word uh, in, in just a minute you have the, the, the apostles Barnabas, the apostles, Paul and then you have the other side the unbelieving Jews the, the two groups now which group was evil and did bad things was it Paul and his group or was it the other, other group the other group. And today, have you observed that? That so many times, and I'm not saying that there's not a radical out there somewhere that does something that he shouldn't, that's promoting a good cause, but most of the time, if there's a rally out here and it's pro-abortion and anti-abortion, the anti-abortion people are not throwing bricks at the cops and shooting people and burning cars and stuff. It's the pro-abortion guys. And when there's the Protest out there somewhere where you've got the pro-gay and the anti-gay. Who, who's doing the damage? Even in our society today. It's usually the radicals that are doing things. People that are trying to stand for the truth and do the right thing. And I know, as I said, sometimes there's somebody that gets overly zealous and does something that you shouldn't do. But most of the time, even today, as we observe things going on, uh, you, you have those that are trying to do right. They're not radical and trying to kill everybody. It wasn't Paul and Barnabas trying to kill the Jews. It was the Jews trying to kill Paul and Barnabas. And that's, uh, that's interesting as you observe that. In verse 6, things get bad and they stir up the people and they're, they're being mean to them. They're despitefully using them. They're harming them. And uh, they flee to Lystra and Derby. They, they decide to leave. We're, we're going to get out of here. We're going to go to another place and we'll preach and teach. And uh, Jesus a lot of times did the same thing. He would go to the city and they received him. He'd stay a while. They didn't want him. He'd go somewhere else. Because your time is too short to stay somewhere where you're not wanted and people are not listening. Doesn't the Bible talk about casting your pearls before a swine? <coughs> you don't want to go and spend every day of your life talking to this atheist over here that doesn't believe in God he doesn't respect the Bible, and you've talked to him ten times, and he's got one to listen. There's some other people out there you need to be talking to. Leave, leave him alone. Maybe he'll come to his senses at a later time. His soul's important, but go, go somewhere else. It's time to leave. They go to Lystra and Derby, which is south of Iconium, and there they preach, we're told. They go there, verse 7, and there they preach the gospel. Now that's why they went. This is not a vacation. It's not a business expedition. They go there to preach the gospel. Now, we had a very interesting thing several years ago, back in the early 90s. The former Soviet Union was opening up, and I was working with the Bible College in Cookville, and we got an opportunity and an invitation for the Bible College professors to come to a, a school in Moscow, Russia, and to teach at their school. They wanted us Americans to come. And they just gave us an, an open invitation to come. Teach whatever you want to teach. All right. So we went over and we taught Bible lessons in the morning and we taught uh, personal Bible studies in the afternoon and then every night we had a gospel meeting there at the college. And we baptized several and started a congregation there in Moscow. Thought that was interesting. At that particular time in the 90s, I couldn't go to my children's public school and lead a prayer or teach the Bible, but communist Russia paid me a food allowance to teach the Bible at their state university. 
was a small allowance, but I was paid by a communist country to teach. And we did that for two or three trips. And then they got to where they wanted less and less Bible things and more and more secular things. They said, we want an English teacher to come over and we won't teach English. We'd like it if you'd bring a banker over with you and teach the principles of banking. And our last time, they said, we want you to come and we want banking and we want English and we want uh, economics taught and no Bible. We didn't go. That's, that's the purpose of our going to start with, to teach the Bible. So, no, we're not flying on the wheel there. We've been freezing half to death in those uh, guest houses that they didn't have the heat turned on. And we can't even teach the Bible. At first, yeah, teach the Bible all day long. Preach at night. Baptize people, yeah. But after they did that for a while, no, we don't want you to preach the gospel. Well, we're not going. And that's, that's Paul. What's your purpose of going to this city? Preach the gospel. You're not there to sell your tents. You're not there to do other things. You're there to preach the gospel. And that's a very, very important thing for them to do. In verse 8, they encounter a certain man of Lystra who was impotent in his feet. Uh, a man whose feet, they're weak, he's unable, or the literal meaning of the word there is unable, or impossible to stand and walk. There was no muscle power that he could stand and walk. It doesn't tell us that he's paralyzed, that he can't move his feet, but they're not strong enough for him to stand and walk. And he's been that way from birth. He's never walked. And uh, the apostles encountered uh, that guy. And we've, we've mentioned that before in our study of miracles. Usually when a miracle was performed, it was of somebody like that. It wasn't Paul taking one of his troop with him everywhere he went and said, now this is John or George over here. And George can't walk. Trust me, he can't walk. And I'm going to heal him. And then the next city, George's name is Fred. And he's blind. And he heals uh, blind Fred. And then the next city, his name is Sam, and he can't talk, and he heals Sam. And that goes on a lot of times in modern-day situation. No, the apostles picked people of their own community, people that you saw, people you knew. There's some people in this uh, area, the Piper area, you know, that are crippled. Uh, there's people in this area that you probably know that are blind. There's people maybe that have an accident and they lost one of their arms or a finger missing. And they've been that way all their life, and you've seen them a hundred times, and you know. Now, if that person that's never walked a day in his life, or that person that's 60 years old, he's been blind every day in his life, and all of a sudden he can see, that, that means something to you, wouldn't it? And that's, that's what happened with that situation. So they, they find this man, and Paul, uh, the same heard Paul speaking, who steadfastly beholding him, and perceived that he had faith to be healed. He's, he's watching Paul. He's listening to Paul. And, and Paul said with a loud voice, Stand upright or stand up straight on your feet. And he didn't get up slowly and fall three times. He didn't take a walker and hobble around the room for two or three weeks. He leaped up and walked. How do you leap up and walk when you've never walked before? How does that happen? Any, any of you ever lose the ability to walk for a period of time due to surgery or something? That'd be a leap of faith. Yeah, that would be a leap of faith. Yeah, yeah I, I remember that happened to me when I had that Gideon Beret and had nerve damage and couldn't walk. I could move my feet, but the muscles, uh, I couldn't, couldn't walk, couldn't stand up at all, period. And after I stayed in the hospital for so long, they put me in rehab, and it took months and months to get me to be able to stand and be able to hold on to something and walk one step, two steps, and hold on to a rail. And finally, I could walk on a walker. And finally, a walking stick. And months and months later, without anything. And I'd walked before. It's not that I'd never walked today in my life. I could walk. And then for a period of a few months, couldn't. This guy's never walked today in his life. And Paul says, get up. And he jumped up and starts running. Not teetering around, you know, needing a walking stick or anything. That's, that's the miracles of the Bible. Miracles of the Bible are complete and whole. A blind man don't say, well, I see something, but it's so bleary I can't make it out. No, he's got perfect vision. 
and a man that couldn't talk. You know, you have to have speech therapy if you can't talk. A lot of folks that have strokes, they have to have speech therapy, don't they? And deaf people, when they can't hear other people talking, they lose their ability to pronounce words properly. So you have somebody that would maybe go through speech therapy for months and months and years. But in the Bible, God never spoke a day in his life, and the apostles heal him, and he's talking like he's been talking all his life. Very clear and plain. That's, that's a real miracle. And again, the purpose is to confirm the word. Now, Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. Well, that's a misunderstanding that people have in, in the Bible in regard to who is healed. But there are times in the Bible where a person's faith in Jesus was responsible for their healing. In Matthew 9, 21 and 22, the woman with an issue of blood says, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. And Jesus told her, thy faith hath made thee whole. Matthew 9, verses 28 and 29, the blind man, Jesus healed him and he said, according to thy faith, be it unto you. If you believe I can do it, then I'll do it. And his faith had something to do with it. In Luke 7, in verse 50, the woman with the alabaster box that was anointing the feet of Jesus, she was a sinner. And they were rebuking her, some of them were, for doing that. And Jesus told her, Thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. In Luke 17, verse 19, when the ten lepers were healed, Jesus told the one that came back and thanked him, he said, Go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. But the other nine were healed too, weren't they? <laughs> but they didn't come back and thank the Lord. Luke 18 and verse 42, a blind man asked for mercy, and Jesus restored his sight, and Jesus told him, Thy faith has saved thee. But then there are other times when people were healed, that it wasn't because of their faith. And uh, John 5 and verse 8, there's a man that had been crippled for 38 years. And uh, he didn't even know who Jesus was. And Jesus told him to arise. And he did. And then in verses 35 through 38, they, they were talking to him about who healed you. And he said, well, this man told me to, to, to get up and do it. Well, who was it? Well, I don't know who he was. And now he learns who Jesus was and he believes after he's healed. And Jesus told him, I'm the Christ. And, and he believed and he has faith after he was healed. So his faith didn't save him. Then in Mark 2, verses 4 through 5, there's a man who's sick and his friends are trying to get him to Jesus and there's so many people around, they can't, they can't get that. So they get up on top of the building. They take off part of the roof. And they let the man down. And the Bible says, when Jesus saw their faith, not the man's faith, but these men had such faith, they said, if we can just get our friend close enough to Jesus, we're going to touch him, he'll heal him. Jesus saw their faith, and the man was healed. And then a classic one is uh, John chapter 11. Lazarus, he was a good man, but he's dead. He's in the grave. How much faith did Lazarus have? Time of his being raised from the dead. None. They had faith while he was alive. He believed in Jesus. But right now he has no faith. So his being raised from the dead couldn't be contributed to his faith. Jesus raised him from the dead. So there are times when people are healed because of their faith. There are times people are healed because of other people's faith. And then there are times people are healed so Jesus can prove that he is the Christ just to confirm the word and help people see and understand. So that, that's important. He told him to stand up upright, straight. The idea, he's never walked. If he could walk bent over, that would be a blessing, wouldn't it? But Jesus didn't tell him to get up and stagger around. Stand up straight. Stand up upright. As if you've been walking all your life. And I venture to say, if you'd been there and seen that, and you'd seen that guy five minutes after Jesus healed him, you wouldn't, unless you saw it with your own eyes, you'd say, well, that man's been walking all his life. Look at him. He can walk just as good as I can. He can run and jump and leap. And... There's nothing wrong with him. 
There wasn't at that particular point, but just a few minutes earlier there was. Verses 11 and 12, the people see this and what was done, and they lift up their voice and they say in the speech of the Lyconians, the gods are come down to us in the likeness of men. These folks are under great influence of the Greeks. And the Greeks had their gods. You've, you've seen movies and you've read poetry and seen this and Zeus and Apollo and Aphrodite and Mercury and Venus and all the, the gods. And that was their, their concept. The gods. They're up there. They're watching. And this is the god of this. And here's the god of that. So when they do this, this is something that's miraculous. Their idea is, well, it must be the gods. It must be the Greek gods. This must be two representatives of the Greek gods that are here. And they're all excited about it. The gods are come down in the likeness of men. And they call Barnabas, uh, in, in verse 12, uh, they call Barnabas Jupiter and Paul Mercurius. Well, uh, when you look at those uh, names, uh, Mercurius, another name for that is Hermes, or Hermes, and he is the messenger god. And Paul was doing most of the speaking, so they viewed he's the messenger god. And then you have uh, Barnabas, who is called Jupiter, or uh, Zeus is another name there, uh, Zeus. And they say, well, he's, he's one of the gods. And they're, they're wanting to offer up sacrifice because this has been their philosophy, their way of life. You offer up sacrifice to the gods. You go uh, burn a sacrifice to a particular god that will help you in a particular situation. So they're, they're thinking we ought to offer up sacrifice to the gods. And uh, Paul, Barnabas, they see this. They lift up their voices, uh, or they see it further uh, down in, in verse uh, 12, 13. It, it says uh, they're going to offer up sacrifice, which when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard, they rent their clothes and ran in among the people. To rent your clothes was a sign of contempt or a sign that you totally disagree. It's about the strongest thing you can do to show your disapproval of something. And you find that with the high priest. When Jesus said, I am the Son of God, he grabbed his clothes and rent them. Ah, you've blasphemed. That was the strongest thing he could do. Although, if you really went back and studied, the high priest wasn't supposed to rent his garment. That was against the rules for the high priest to do that, but he didn't care. He's going to kill an innocent man. Why would you care about tearing your garment? You don't care about the law of, of God and the way they had their trial at night where they didn't have the Sanhedrin. That'd be sort of like the Congress and Senate today want to pass a bill. So let's just, for illustration's sake, let's say it's a bill the Democrats want to pass. So they just don't tell the Republicans and all the Democrats come in and we vote and pass it. That's not fair. You can't do that. You can't have a secret meeting of just the Democrats or a secret meeting of just the Republicans and pass a bill. But that's what they did with the Sanhedrin. They got the ones they knew that hated Jesus together and they're gonna have a little meeting and they're going to say, crucify him, kill him, get rid of him. Interesting here, <clears throat> as we uh, look at this in, in verse 14, it says, the apostles, Barnabas and Paul. Barnabas is called an apostle. <laughs> and when we go back and look through the list of the apostles, Barnabas was not one of the twelve apostles. But that word is used in different ways in the New Testament. The word apostle literally means a delegate, an ambassador, a messenger, or one sent. Well, the apostles, in, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 12, Jesus called out the disciples 12, and he called them apostles. Now watch. They're apostles. That is, they're delegates. They're ambassadors. They're messengers, and they're sent. And who were they sent by? Jesus. So this is a unique wording, use of that word, the apostles. Many times it will say the apostles, the 12 apostles. 
But then in verses like Galatians 1 and verse 19, uh, other apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Well, that's not James the apostle. He's killed in Acts 12. And James is referred to as an apostle. One who's sent. Now, Paul and Barnabas go to Antioch, and they give them the funds, and they're going to go out preaching the gospel in this missionary journey, and they commissioned Paul and Barnabas to go out and preach. So they're sent on a mission. And that's how Barnabas is referred to as an apostle. He's not one of the apostles in the use of the word, the office of an apostle, but he's an apostle in the sense that he is one that's been sent or commissioned to go on this particular mission. Uh, they're crying out. They, they ran on them crying out saying, uh, Why do you do these things? We also are men of like passions with you and preach unto you that you should turn from these vanities, that is, this idol worship, this believing in Zeus and Jupiter and Pluto or the other, uh, Mercury's rather, and the other gods that they're worshiping and following, these vanities, and turn to the living God. Notice the contrast. These gods that you're worshiping, it's vanity, that's empty, that's vain. What can Zeus do for your sins? What can Mercury do for you on the day of judgment? Or any of the other gods. Absolutely nothing. But the God of heaven can. The true God is contrasted with the false gods. And notice, you ought to turn from that. Not only turn from, this is, this is the true definition of repentance. Repentance is not just stop doing bad things. Turn from these vanities unto the living God. Turn from and turn to. When we obey the gospel, we turn from sin and turn to God. And let God decide what we do in our lives. The living God, uh, as opposed to the dead gods. You know, isn't it amazing? And Isaiah dealt with that. He talked about a man that goes to the forest and he cuts down a tree. And he saws up part of the tree. And let's just say, for sake of illustration, it's a big tree. And part of that tree, he makes this wooden podium. And then part of that tree, he has scraps. And he puts that over here in his fire. And he kindles the fire. And he cooks and eats off of that. And then another part of that tree, he fashions it like a cow or a goat. And he puts it up on the stand. And he bows down and he worships that thing. That same tree, you use the wood to kindle, to make your fire. You made a piece of furniture. And now you're over here worshiping it. And that thing you're worshiping, who made it? I did, if it's an idol. Who existed first, that idol or me? Me. Who's more powerful, that idol or me? I am. I can look at that idol and say, you know that cow looks more like a pig than it does a cow. I, I'm not a very good carver. I'm going to throw it in the fire and make me another one. Can I do that? I have the power over my God that I'm worshiping. This little piece of wood that's sitting up on the thing over here. That's, that's crazy. And Isaiah points out the folly of man making something with his hands and then bowing down before it. Oh, it's so great and magnificent. It's God. No, no. Serve the living God. And who is this living God? He made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all things that are therein. He's all powerful. Unlike Zeus and some of these others who are just existing in the imagination of men, the God of heaven is real. Who in times past suffered all nations to walk in their own ways. Uh, they did things that they shouldn't have done. That doesn't say that they're not under law. But he's making a contrast. And he tells them, even though the Gentiles were not following the law of, of Moses, nevertheless, he left them not without witness. And of course, uh, they've always been under law. Everybody's been under law. And the reason we know that is sin is the transgression of the law. If there's no law, can there be sin? If there are no speed limits, can you get a ticket for speeding? No. There are no speed limits. How in the world could a policeman pull you over and write you a ticket? 
when there's a sign on the road there that says drive as fast as you want to, there are no limits. And you can get a ticket for speeding. Sin is a transgression of the law. It's breaking the law. And the Jews and the Gentiles sin by breaking God's law. But notice this, verse 17. He left himself, or he didn't leave himself without witness. In other words, he did leave a witness. Psalm 14, 1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. That, that says that I can reason from nature to God. Now, I can't reason from nature to know that I should take the Lord's Supper on the first day of every week. I can't reason that. I can't reason from nature that I need to hear, believe, repent, confess, and be baptized. But I can reason from nature that there had to be a beginning. Matter is not eternal. Oak trees come from acorns. And acorns are planted and you have oak trees. And then oak trees drop acorns. Which came first? You had to have either an acorn or an oak tree to start it all out. The old adage, which came first, the chicken or the egg, is a legitimate question. You can't just say there's always been chickens. And the Bible answers that, doesn't it? In the book of Genesis, God created animals. We created chickens. And those chickens laid eggs. And those eggs hatched and had more chickens. And that's still going on today. So he, he didn't leave them without witness. He gave them witness. He gave us rain from heaven, fruitful seasons, filling our hearts with food and gladness. God, His care, His protection. You, know, you can count on the sun coming up tomorrow and going down tomorrow night. It's not going to stay up six days. and It's not going to go down and stay down for six days. You can count on it. The earth's not going to stop spinning and we all fall off of it. You can count on God. He's going to give us seasons. Spring. Summer, fall, and winter. That happens every year in areas where they have those. There's some areas that uh, we say that about Malaysia, and we go over there, they have two seasons, hot and hotter. <laughs> so, but we're blessed to see four seasons here. And with these sayings, scarcely or scarce restrained they, the people, that they had not done sacrifice to them. So, as Paul and them are talking, <clears throat> these people are just, they're wanting so bad to offer up sacrifice. And uh, they came certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let's, let's back up here. They stoned Paul. Look at how fickle people are. The gods have come down among us. Let's offer sacrifice to them. A few verses later, let's kill them. That's pretty fickle, isn't it? <laughs> You don't need friends like that, do you? You're the greatest thing you ever want. I hate you. <laughs> you know, you don't need people like that in your life. Such fickle people. We're going to worship you. Now these folks come down and change their mind, and now they want to kill him. Remember, Paul said, "Don't be like children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind and doctrine." So you shouldn't be so immature that somebody can. There is a God. Five minutes later, there is no God. This is the greatest man I've ever watched. No, let's kill him. So they stoned him. They stoned him. And uh, verse 19, they drew him out as being dead. Now when you stone a person, well, if you've given it a whole lot of thought, they don't pick up marbles and throw it. Maybe you've seen some videos and things of this on the Jewel Little Film Strips and other places where somebody would have a rock the size of a cantaloupe and have it over their head. The, the purpose of stoning somebody is to break as many bones as you can and kill them. That's what you're doing. This is capital punishment. You're not trying to flog their back and, and hurt them a little bit. You're not trying to break a bone so they'll be in pain. You're trying to kill them. And the vital places to kill somebody would be the head. So you pick up a rock the size of a cantaloupe and throw it down as hard as you can and you're standing up and you hit a man in the head with it, you, you definitely can kill him. So that's what they're trying to do. They're not being easy. And they think he's dead. And they drag him out of the city for dead. You think that has stopped? If he's still moaning and saying, no, don't hit me again, please. No, they're going to they're gonna throw and throw and throw till he's dead. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, Paul says, once was I stoned. 
So at the time he wrote that, he'd only been stoned one time. And we don't have anything else in the New Testament that would contradict that. So he was stoned once. And that, that's here. Could it possibly be that the stoning of Paul is what we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 2. I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I could not tell or out of the body I could not tell. God knoweth. Such a one caught up into the third heaven and such a man and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth. He was caught up in the paradise, heard unspeakable words, which is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one will I glory, yet not of myself. Could that possibly be him that he's talking about? Many I think so. And could he be referring to this incident and that they did kill him? His spirit did leave his body and went up to heaven, and then God let him come back because he went through it. He had more things to do. I, I wouldn't be dogmatic on that, but that's uh, the only place anywhere I know of in the New Testament that would even come close to fitting. And you know they would do everything they could to keep on hitting him until they thought he was dead, and, and he may have been dead. And when Paul says that I bear the marks of Christ in my body, can you imagine the, the whippings and the beatings on his back? Of the Jews, five times received by forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Paul probably had a lot of scars in his body. He probably wasn't all that pleasant to look at physically. All right, and then uh, as we go on down, they, they stand round about him. They think he's dead, and he may have been dead. And he rose up and came into the city the next day. So they stoned him, thinking he's dead. He just gets up and walks off. Sort of like another time when that poisonous viper bit him. He just shook it off in fire and just, it didn't hurt him. God's not ready for him to be through yet. But he was confirming the disciples. They go back and uh, talks about verse 23. They're ordaining the elders in every church. Or every, yeah, ordaining the elders in every church. And the implication is there that you ordain elders in every church, or that they did, where men were qualified. Obviously, you couldn't ordain elders if men didn't meet the qualifications. And uh, I know of some congregations that uh, mainly made up of women, and they have two or three men, and they're 15 years old and 20 years old, and they certainly couldn't qualify as elders. The word elder is used in two different senses in the Bible. Sometimes it's the office of an elder, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 7. If a man desires the office of an elder, he desires a good work. Titus 1, verses 5 through 9, refers to the office of an elder. But in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, you look at that particular passage, and there, elder just has reference to one who is older. Uh, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. Oh, excuse me, let me back up. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, he says, uh, verse 1, Rebuke not an elder, and treat him as a father, and the younger men as brethren. So now look at the contrast here. you got elder, treat him as a father, and younger men. you got elder men and younger men. That's older men and younger men. There's no office called younger men in the Bible. That's just how they reference. And then he goes on in verse 2, and the elder women as mothers. That's not the office of female elders. <laughs> That's talking about older women, more mature women. And the younger women. So you got older men, younger men. Older women, younger women. And then later on, drop down to verse 17, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. There's the office. They rule well. And thou shalt not muzzle the ox when he treads out the corn. So the word sometimes is used to refer to one who is older, and sometimes it's used to refer to the office of an elder. You have to let the context determine. And then back to Acts uh, chapter 14, verse 26. 
they sail from Antioch. They go back, those verses there. He goes back to the city where he was stoned. That took a lot of courage on his part, but they needed to go back and strengthen the brethren that obeyed the gospel, and he's willing to do that. Then verse 26, they're going to go back to Antioch and Syria, where they started from. And then when they're going to get there, they're going to give a report. They're going to tell the brethren there that sent them on this trip all the good that was done. So that's, uh, that's interesting. All right, we're out of time. We'll stop there. Uh, chapter 15 talks about the Jerusalem Council, uh, where they had that division, and they met to deal with it. So thank you for your good attention.